Hey everybody, JD here. Thanks for tuning in. We've got another great show for you. This is episode 10, by the way. And uh, this evening we have a really cool guest, Vince Bryan, uh, the CEO of Whoosh uh, Innovations, which is a company that is making some unbelievably cool uh, sort of outside the box thinking ways of getting salmon over dams, salmon, steelhead, all kinds of different fish. So we're going to get into that with him in just a minute. But first, we have a couple of uh, really eh, kind of big announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, I've been working on a online steelhead course for, holy moly, two plus years or so. And it's designed for the beginner to, let's call them frustrated intermediate and it's all the stuff that I wished I'd had when I was starting out. And it's got six hours of video lessons and, and just all kinds of stuff. I'll give you just a quick sample. Uh, I'll let you know when it's out, but it's coming soon. I'm very excited because this has been a uh, labor of love for sure. I mean, a long process. But here's just kind of a little, little, little clip to kind of give you an idea of what's in it. One of the things I wish I had had somebody show me more when I was first steelhead fishing is all these little terms you hear about a bucket, a flat, a tail out, a seam. Well, I'm going to show you some of these. And this right here is a classic seam. So what we have right off the tip of this rock here is a nice little current seam. The water's coming off this point and you can almost see a line right out where my planer is right down, going downstream and those fish will sit right on the edge, kind of have their shoulder on the fast water, but most of their bodies in on the little bit slower water. It gives them a place to hide. Typically behind a rock wall or a riprap point like this, you're gonna have a little scour out too, so it's a little deeper right there. These fish migrating up here don't really want to swim up this main channel. They like a little bit of, little bit of protection over there on the, the current seam. And so I'm just gonna run a little plug through there with a side planer. You could fish this with a bobber pretty easily too. It's a little tougher to hit with drift gear because you're Stuff's only going to be in the on that line for a few bounces, but side planer, I can just leave that thing sitting right there in that seam. So we've been talking about seams, and here's another prime example of a good spot to fish for steelhead. This log we have here is kicking up a little current seam on both sides of it as the water wraps around. The steelhead aren't going to lay very often in the back eddy behind the log, unless the current's just raging but they're gonna lay right on the inside edge of that seam on either side. So I'm gonna throw one in there just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. This is a great spot for a bobber because I can run it right down that seam, nice and straight, right where the fish. Okay, okay, you get, the, you get the idea. So six hours of me telling you all that stuff, which may or may not be a good thing, <laughs> but now literally it's, it's something that I thought about, you know, what. What would I have wanted when I was beginning steelhead fishing? And, and so it's all in there. So again, I will uh, bring that up to you uh, as it is available. Secondly, tonight we have a brand new contest. And it is sponsored by Douglas Rods. And you all know that I am a huge fan of Douglas Rods. So we're going to give away, or Douglas is going to give away through us, <laughs> to be specific, uh, an LRS rod, which are awesome. They are the best rod on the market for the money. And you're going to be able to pick it. I think there's a few parameters in there, but you're going to be able to pick from their catalog and uh, appear on the show. And this contest is going to go through June 12th at 1159 P uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, so go ahead. And the, the way you enter this sucker is... You're going to go to this new, I can't even remember my own new contest website. There it is. <laughs> so head on over to fishwithjdcontest.com and uh, follow the instructions there and uh, you will be entered. And then we were going to draw the winner of that sucker uh, after uh, June 12th. And then um, we will uh, be bringing that person, he or she, onto the show. Uh, so that'll be fun. And uh, so pretty cool. Douglas rods are awesome. And we'll get into more of that at some point on uh, exactly what uh, what ones I use. Uh, they're just I mean, they're all cool. There's there's a Douglas rod for just about anything you want. So uh, make sure you enter. And again, that let's see here. Address is 
fishwithjdcontest.com right there. And that, uh, that'll that get you into it. And if you want, maybe bonus points, maybe not. It uh, doesn't hurt to subscribe to and like and do all that good stuff on Facebook and YouTube. So anyway, uh, those are our big announcements. Uh, anything else? No, I guess that's it for that. So let's get right into uh, whoosh. We're going to bring Vince in here. Vince. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, you guys have uh, just a, such an interesting story, an interesting product that we're going to get into. Um, so one of the things that it, it you're, you're in your mission statement uh, at Whoosh Innovations is uh, that hydropower and salmon don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. Is that kind of what I'm, I'm reading into that? Well, we don't have time for them to be mutually exclusive. Right. I think that's, I think Clock that's is ticking. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I, I, I think in an ideal world uh, for the for the fish, uh, that would be the case. But if you if you look at if you step back and you look at the bigger world and say, hey, we've got to get to a carbon free uh, space so that we're not acidifying the oceans and hurting them there as well and so forth. We have to find a way to make this all work together. And uh, and in many of these rivers, uh, really the fish don't have the time to be arguing over a license that may be going on for 25 or 30 year, more years. Uh, so so right. we uh, we wanted to find a solution and I think we've uh, done a pretty good job of that. Okay, so so backing up yeah. um, and, and, and let me give everybody, so this started with the salmon cannon, right? Back in 2011-ish or 14, when, when was back a ways. And you had some sort of little epiphany in an orchard, is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the core technology, we started actually in 2008, and we were trying to develop an apple harvester. We, in fact, developed the apple harvester. And the issue was, how do you get an apple from the tree into the bin without bruising the apple? Uh, because uh, there, there was labor shortages and so forth, and, and uh, we needed to make that more efficient. So that led to the, the development of the core technology of moving um, objects, uh, in that case, an apple, and later a uh, fish within a soft, flexible tube. And then we've now optimized that tube specifically for fish and added misting in the tube uh, to keep it wet and um, frictionless, basically, as well as uh, in the blower that we use, we cool the air so that it is approximates the temperature of the water that the fish was just in. So there's no... There's no thermal shock for the fish. Either. Right. Wow. So uh, now we're going to back up here. So this this whole apple thing sort of morphed into the the salmon cannon, which was your original technology, correct? And so I have a little uh, little info kind of describing that. So this was kind of the early days, right? That's exactly right. Uh, and the, that core technology is uh, works very much the same. Uh, uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is create a pressure differential between the front of the fish and the back of the fish. And uh, if you create a frictionless environment, that pressure differential can be very low pressure, um, about one PSI, which for the fish feels about uh, like 30 inches of water. So they feel like they're in 30 inches of water and they actually act like it in the tube. But all that's in the tube is, is air and uh, this mis mist to keep it lubricated. Very interesting. I have a, uh, let's see here. So that's, that's, uh, that's an actual shot of a fish going through the system, correct? Yeah. In this, in this case, uh, this is the, uh, this is a shot of a fish going through. We also developed a, uh, what we call our facial recognition system. So one of the challenges early on was if you have a wide range of fish in a river, uh, one tube can't transport every size fish. So we had to get the fish into the right size tube. Oh, of course. And so uh, this is a scanner that that uh, in the automated system, which we now call our whoosh passage portal, uh, this would take a picture of the fish, uh, actually 18 pictures of the fish before uh, they reached the tube and we would direct the fish into the appropriate tube. So this is what the fish look like um, uh, coming. They've just come uh, over a false weir and that's a, uh, and now they're they're sliding uh, for about a half a second on this white background that you see. And then we're imaging the fish. And by the time they exit, uh, and that's again within a half a second, uh, the computer has made a decision of, about the the length of the fish, the girth of the fish, and the circumference of the fish. Wow. And 
and directed them into the in the appropriate size tubes so that they transport efficiently. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. And, and as I was reading more on it, uh, you can sort for hatchery versus wild. You can sort for different species. Uh, you know, if you've got some sort of, you know, like <clears throat> in California, if you saw white bass, that would be considered an invasive species you didn't want uh, going over your dam. And so you can sort those out. And and uh, I also saw that uh, you can sort for uh, or take a look at uh, fish that have injuries and I mean, just all kinds of really neat stuff. So right. there's a, uh, let's give you everybody just a little more uh, kind of video here. What do I do with it? Uh, there it is. So this back well he's still there we are a little technical difficulties there as as usual but that kind of sums it up and uh it's it's just such such cool technology um so some of the advantages to this uh it, it's a lot less costly right from uh some of these other fish passage things that put in giant ladders and and elevators and all these things that people are doing that, that's a significant one. It's it's both uh, cost savings and time savings. Uh, so in both of those uh, products that you described, a fish ladder or a fish lift, they call, mm -hmm. um, is a, a fair amount of civil work uh, required. And because there's all that civil work, uh, now you're, you've got the environmental uh, rules and uh, permitting and so forth that really can extend it out uh, forever. And if it's part of a, a federal or a hydropower dam, yeah. um, it becomes even a longer process. So even if you want to make a change um, at some of these locations uh, to get through that process can be years and years. Um, and uh, uh, so what we did uh, with the passage portal was really looked at the legal <laughs> problems of, of getting uh, things, but we were also solving, uh, we always come from the fish's perspective first. And actually your, your little video beforehand uh, talking about the seams, mm -hmm. uh, that is exactly what we're doing with the passage portal. That, uh, that whole system is built on a floating barge. And uh, the, the whole theory is with a, a ladder or lift, you, you have to attract the fish over to the ladder, um, right. which may be only on one side of the river, for example. That becomes a, a problem for the fish. Uh, they, 
they, if they're on the other side, it, it may uh, really delay their migration, for example, um, before, they find, before they find it. So our thought was, well, just like you're seeing, we, we know where the fish go. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so if we know where the fish are, why don't we put the system where the fish is? And if we take advantage of those seams and so forth, uh, they're much more likely to find us. We're going to use the natural attraction mm. flow in the river itself to to bring them to our entrance, and then we just have to get them to go in. It's a much easier uh, ask of the fish. Now the uh, the salmon can in the original one was a, a manual feed, like you're literally putting a cannonball in. But this new one, the passage portal, it's it's all automated, correct? Right. So we started with the manual system uh, where the person is basically doing the sorting because we had not yet developed the uh, the algorithms and the s software and the scanning portion that that could do the automatic sorting. And we had to uh, essentially get through a regulatory uh, approval process that uh, that allowed us to put uh, the system in where there were endangered species. Uh, so we had to prove repeatedly in many uh, waterways and many species that the fish going through the whoosh tube, uh, not only the adult that transferred to those tubes uh, exited um, and were uh, not injured and they were uh, as in good a shape or better than uh, the other alternatives out there, but that the, um, the, the eggs and the fecundity of the fish was as good or better than um, any of the alternatives. And so, uh, We've done about 20 different studies, uh, been participated in 20 studies. They were independent laboratories that did those studies, you know, from Norway to uh, uh, here up here in Washington State, down in California, we've done some as well. And uh, all with the purpose of proving that the system is safe for the fish. Because generally speaking, and as fishermen, you know, you know, if you handle the fish too much, if you've got them out of water too much, uh, it stresses the fish. and uh, and sometimes they don't make it. Um, and uh, our whole focus, uh, and it really came out of that core DNA that we have as how do you how do you keep an apple from bruising, which bruises if you drop it from a half an inch high, you've got a bruise on your apple. So we were coming from that DNA, if you will, that thinking it, it's got to be incredibly uh, safe for the fish. Um, and having uh, developed the uh, the tube system and and getting acceptance in the hatchery settings for uh, or broodstock settings for moving what are very valuable fish, those that are going to be used for producing eggs and so forth, sure. we uh, were then able to move into the uh, into the rivers themselves. And uh, and those rivers have gotten bigger and and the problems <laughs> that we're solving are bigger as well. Sure, sure. So here's a here's a you can see it's like faster than a speeding bullet Chinook going through. Uh, through the tube. And uh, so one of the advantages then, as I'm kind of seeing it, is, is kind of uh, illustrated by this. You go through the whoosh tube as a fish, you almost don't even know what hits you, just when it's over. Or you can climb and climb and climb some of these massive ladders that go on forever and, uh, you know, all the while zapping your strength. So it just seems like uh, that's a huge advantage as well, too. Just the, the quick, uh, you know, shoot through and it's over. And then you guys had, I think this was on your Facebook page, kind of a clever little cartoon. And uh, you want to go the stairs or you want to take the elevator? And so um, that, uh, that that's kind of a, putting it into layman's terms there. But uh, for, for sure, we, we did do a study that was really pretty interesting. Um, it was a comparison of the ladder next to a, uh, a, a, a our tube whoosh system. And it was just uh, 15 vertical feet at a, at a dam. Uh -huh. And then they were... It was 900 sockeye and they were tagged and the fish that went through the whoosh system ended up river about a hundred miles further up river in the next week than those fish that had to go up oh. another 15 vertical feet. Wow. So you're, exa you're exactly right. It's, 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 uh, I, I like to say that the fish migratory fish like salmon are like a battery. Um, and, uh, when they, they have to use that burst swimming, it's like, you know, putting the accelerator down repeatedly. And you're just burning that battery up. And uh, and so really what's happening in many of these situations, everybody thinks the ladders are working. They are. The, the fish is getting uh, past that particular dam. Right. But they've probably exhausted themselves to a point where they are not successfully spawning in many instances. And that's 
and that's not captured in the data. No, that's that's fascinating. And, and especially when you talk about the, the, the dam in your example was only 15 feet high. I mean, those Columbia dams on and on and on. I mean, just uh, that must just just take it out of them. Yeah, well, the, to, to clarify, it was the last 15 feet at a Columbia River Dam that we were doing oh, okay. this. So we diverted the fish off gotcha. into our system. And so they'd already come up 100, and in that instance, it was 180 feet wow. vertical climb. Uh -huh. Then we put them through the whoosh system, and the other fish continued up the ladder. And uh, it was the whoosh fish that ended up 100 miles further upstream in the next week. Three, yeah. three further dams. Um, wow. And it was just, it was remarkable what the difference was between the two. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. I mean, wow, you start kind of extrapolating that out to, uh, you know, larger cases and, and holy moly, that, I mean, the fitness well, level of the fish could be just greatly improved. I, I think, uh, you know, with climate change and the waters warming up here where the fish have to get through the lower elevations more quickly before they... Uh, succumb to the temperatures and so forth. It it gives them an obvious advantage that they could get uh, further up river into safe, cooler water. Um, uh, so we think the potential uh, certainly for salmon all along the the west coast is huge. But it these other issues that you brought up earlier about uh, removing invasive species are equally important because that goes right to the habitat question. Right. And uh, and uh, if you can improve the habitat or increase the habitat simply by removing the invasive species, mm -hmm. uh, boy, you've you've got a double win there. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's yeah, man. So so cool. Such neat stuff. So uh, you've got these things in Europe, places I, I assume somewhere where Atlantic salmon are running, or, or... yeah, Norway and Sweden. Okay. Um, and we actually started in Norway, uh, and it was because of the regulatory uh, environment uh, here with the um, environment uh, with the Endangered Species Act. Oh. Uh, we we wanted to start with uh, farm salmon, mm -hmm. and the biggest place they farm salmon is in Norway. Sure, it, it gave us an obvious advantage from a uh, development standpoint because we had fish year round that we could work with, mm -hmm. and uh, and we didn't have to worry about uh, if we made a mistake uh, okay. uh, that we were. We're hurting yeah, not fish. a wild fish that you've uh, destroyed. Right. So yeah. uh, so all of our early work was done there. That gave us a foothold there. But the focus was more on aquaculture um, uh, fish at that point. But our, our goal was always back here in the Northwest and, uh, and uh, the U.S. Uh, how, do we, how do we return the rivers to what they were when I was a kid? I mean, I, I would go out of the house in the creek in the backyard and fish all the, all the time, you know, for sure usually trout, but every you'd see salmon come through there mm -hmm. um, through part of the year. And uh, and so fish have always been a big part of uh, my life. So really, we uh, we had a choice to make as a company back in 2013. Uh, are we going to try to do continue to do the ag and the fish together? Or are we going to focus? And we decided we're going to focus and it's going to be on fish. Wow. And uh, and uh, we're really glad we made that decision. Um, it's been a it's been a long road, but uh, but we're involved in some pretty cool projects right now that are you know going to really make a difference. We believe. Yeah, um, so cool. So, how are the agencies? Um, uh, are they getting on board with you? You know, all the fish and wildlife, fish and game, just all the in FERC and CEQA, NEPA, you know, all that. I mean, there's there's all <laughs> yeah. kinds of layers there. There are, there are many layers. Um, I think uh, the, the short answer is we've come a long way. We're not um, there everywhere. So it's, it's a little bit uneven depending on where you are. Uh, you're down in California and uh, it's, it's ripe for our technology. It is perfect and there's many applications there. Yes. Um, they, they have unfortunately fallen in love with trap and haul um, in uh, California and uh, and uh, they, they <laughs> uh, have some, uh, some reading to do, I think, to understand really uh, uh, how that, that can be improved upon. So um, we're, we, we will get there. Uh, National Marine Fishery Service is really the fish, uh, agency that is most uh, in charge. We have quarterly meetings with them now oh, good. Uh, where we keep them up to speed on the technology. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, we have a representative from the five different regions around the country that uh, we update. 
so they're aware of what's going on. Uh, they, are, they are not concerned about the tube anymore. Um, so we're pretty much back past that. Uh, we did a study uh, last year on the Columbia uh, as well uh, that was uh, really focused on can we handle the big river situations um, uh, where like the Columbia or the, um, the American River, for example, down, down in yeah. California, those kinds of, uh, uh, can we attract them in and so forth? And I think that uh, what we've really been showing is, you know, the issue of attracting the fish in is the same issue for us as it is for a ladder or anywhere else. We That's just true. have, yeah, we just that. have a little more flexibility because we can move the, put the system wherever we need to. Sure. Now are the, uh, can you customize the size for, so say somebody needs one on a, a smaller Creek, uh, obviously you're not going to bring this bad boy into <laughs> to that situation. So are there scalable models of this, this whole deal? There are. Um, so it was, it was modular designed from a modular perspective. Um, so it's really how we package it up for the situation. If, uh, uh, you know, if the creek is too small, um, it, it, it may not make economic sense e even for us. Um, sure. if, but having said that, uh, I can give examples of even culverts where um, it's going to cost, uh, you know, like $50 million. This culvert goes underneath I-90 coming out of Lake Sammamish and the Kokanee salmon there. Um, and the culvert broke in the middle underneath I-90. And so it's created a waterfall under under the major interstate well you could just run the tube a thousand feet to the other side of the culvert you know whoosh right through up. there and whoosh them right past that yeah um, we would be a fraction of the cost in that kind of a situation and that creek is not more than 10 feet wide so um i think that uh the applications are many it's not all um sure um so what do you have any Anyway, because down here, uh, there's talk of, um, uh, you know, trying to get passage over places like Inglebright Dam on the Yuba system. They want to try to get springers and steelhead and those kind of things back there. And Inglebright is uh, 285 feet. So is that um, is that within the realm of possibility? And then we have Shasta, which is, you know, 602 feet or something in Oroville. And you mentioned um, yeah. the American, which is Folsom. Are those, are those uh, too big a scale or is nope. that? A... Uh, nope. Uh, so uh, Inglebright, we've actually given a quote to the Army Corps. I think that's the Army Corps dam. Yep. Um, yep. And uh, uh, that was uh, a while ago, but things move slowly there. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, but uh, we've had a couple projects, successful projects up here with the Army Corps. And okay. I think that they're coming around to the, the uh, idea of it as well. Um, regarding the height, uh, the longest system that we've done is 1,700 feet. Um, at 1,100 feet, um, and that we have to put in a booster pump if we go that long, but 1,100 feet, we can do it with the, the, the main system, the base system. Uh -huh. And uh, at a 40 degree angle, that means we can go over a 700 foot dam. So, so <laughs> what? Too what cool. we have done is uh, the highest dam we've gone up to the top of at this point is uh, Chief Joseph Dam on the Columbia River, and that's uh, 235 feet. Wow. What a hell of a ride for a fish. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, we, you know, they keep coming back down and wanting to do it again. It's a, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Uh, and I had a, a picture here. Let's see if I still have it. So this will give people a, uh, kind of a, a small scale it looks like you guys do some outreach kind of school project stuff and so this looks like a mini version of it but i thought it was kind of cool because it and this this may be the old salmon cannon but but just the the idea of the tube going up and over and uh and i thought that was kind of just a, a cool yeah. diagram of the of yeah the that's at, actually at alden labs and uh who was a group uh on the east coast of massachusetts that we work with quite a bit and uh they had a all day session for the agencies on the East coast there. And uh, that's a smaller tube. That is the salmon cannon. Um, we actually ran that out of the back of a, a rented expedition there. And uh, <laughs> uh, we set that up um, and uh, they had a group come out uh, of all different agencies. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was there um, and the uh, state agencies. Uh, and we were running uh, trout 
through the through oh that too. So you're doing doing live fish cool yeah cool you weren't uh you weren't doing uh fake fish like john oliver <laughs> we were not uh but uh you know john oliver uh certainly made the name salmon cannon fam famous yeah. um and uh and uh, it also created a problem for us at the same time because uh, it, it implies something that's not gentle um and destructive oh, yeah, uh, he... <laughs> but so... it sounds really cool uh so sure. we we've more recently uh we've been removing one of the ends um which is and uh, so the salmon cannon yes. and really saying you know we're really trying to speak to to the truth about uh the fish and so forth in almost every instance, uh, it's amazing how politics has uh, flavored the language that is being used. And uh, there's very few people actually focused on the problem. Uh, and it, it, they've broken it down into two, uh, only two options. You take down the dam or you leave it up. Right. And, um, and that uh, seems to us that uh, that's a really a limited uh, view of the world and that there oftentimes are uh, pretty easy solutions that can be brought to the table. Sure. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, there's, there's more of the old three sides to a story uh, <laughs> type situation. So do you have, um, uh, getting back to what I was thinking about on Inglebright and, and all those, the, the big issue getting, it seems like okay, especially with with your guys' technology, getting the fish over the dam is not the problem. It's getting the juveniles back out, and I know they have the the gulper system and those kind of things, which sound like they're you know, fifty million dollars or something crazy. Do you guys have any or, or anything in the works, uh, some sort of technology to try to solve that problem with fish? You know, getting the smolts back down. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna I'll tell you I have a we have a perspective on this. It's a little different than, again, what's usually discussed out there. So um, on the downstream side, uh, if you think about it, if you have to get a fish over a dam going downstream, mm -hmm. the issue is the same. You have to go up to go down. You have to go right. over the dam or you have to go through it. So right. the problem is the same there. With the juveniles, though, the disadvantage is, uh, is simply that they're they're spread all over the place in the reservoirs and they're not. And so the issue is how do you get them to come to you? Um, how do you get them to collect rather than uh, have them go through the turbines or over the spillway uh, where they may not uh, survive as well? Um, I think uh, one of the things that uh, we have um, ascertained and that nobody wants to talk about this and sometimes it's the state agencies that don't want to talk about it. And sometimes it's the fishermen too. Um, in many of these instances, the fish actually survive going through the turbines. Um, the problem is that they have nitrogen narcosis so, um, mm -hmm. from the pressure differential that they've just gone through for about 10 minutes. And so from a predator standpoint, they are easy yep. feed. Yep. And from birds above and fish below, and they just get devoured during this time. And um, so the predatory fish, especially the invasive species that are in the river systems there, uh, you know, they just hang out right there to, to, to feed. So that's, that's a big part of the problem and there's no really way to measure it well. Uh, our solution to the problem, so, so from a mathematical standpoint, what you ought to do is spend much more time and money getting your adult fish up. So you just have more juveniles coming down because mathematically, with the salmon, for example, Chinook, you're going to have five or 6,000 juveniles coming down for every pair that you get up. Right. So that makes sense. You're only going to get back a small percentage of those. But if you get back uh, you know, 2% of the fish, you can, you can grow your population again. Sure. Sure. So how do you assure that you're going to get those 2% back? And uh, I think that's what you're getting. Can you, and where people are focused is how do you get them uh, uh, past the dams? Well, it's, I, I think the answer is actually in um, renewable energy here too. Mm. And if you look at where floating solar has gone, mm -hmm. um, and Japan is leading the world in this, they now have 54 uh, uh, floating solar uh, uh, in, in reservoirs above the dams. Mm -hmm. it's, it does two things. One, it uh, actually does three. It, it, it keeps the uh, uh, the water cooler. For sure. It's, it's, it shades it like just like you would have trees. 
So if you um, and and uh, it if um, properly uh, constructed, mm -hmm. you can actually guide the fish to where you want them because they're going to use that shaded area mm -hmm. as protection from the predators in there to help get them to where you want them to go. Once you've got them to where you want them to go, the issue is the same. It for us, it's we can whoosh them down. It doesn't matter to us. You still have to go up to go down, right. and uh, we deliver them downstream safely. Mm. So it's a different problem, and uh, we have been um, uh, encouraging uh, uh, the Department of Energy uh, to really look at this problem as uh, places like the Columbia, where uh, the Department of Ecology here has made uh, the water temperature, for example, a real issue um, that the dam owner operators are gonna have to deal with in a more stringent way. In fact, they may not be able to deal with it at all. Um, unless you figure out a way to keep the water cooler. So if you can reduce the evaporation in the water. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the, the key things that we've been bringing to the table here is you've got to make this work economically too. Sure. Ten, up to 10% of the water uh, leaves a reservoir through the fish ladders at a dam. Wow. Um, if you can just capture uh, some of that water and let that water go through the turbines, that money that's generated there, Boom. properly directed, can go to all sorts of fisheries uh, issues. And now you're not only paying for the woosh system, you're paying for the um, recovery of the fish and the environmental things. And and if you put solar in the in the uh, in the in the four bays above the dams, you're also generating revenue. So it's a matter of bringing the technology to the uh, problem that we've created over the last hundred years. Um, and that has been really exacerbated by the change of climate. Wow, that is, I mean, just the the way you guys are thinking, I'm just loving it so much. It's so, so not it's not black and white. You're, you got a whole nother, uh, you know, like you say, three sides to every story and it's fascinating. Now, uh, one of the things that I've kind of noticed, uh, thought about is you guys can also, I mean, I don't know how fast you can mobilize, but, um, it seems to me that you could be uh, helpful in, in some sort of uh, situation uh, like in, we had on the, uh, the Fraser there at, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the big rock slide. And, and I didn't hear if you guys got further involved in that or not, but uh, it seems to me your, your technology uh, makes a lot of sense. You're not going to build a fish ladder right there. And, 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 and to back up, <laughs> Uh, just to let people know, there's a. It was about a year ago. I think it was in June of last year. Big, big collapse of um, uh, at Big Bar there, a big rock slide, and and made this uh, barrier that um, was looking like it could be impassable to salmon. And so that's where it seems like a, a whoosh emergency team could uh, zip in there and, and get something done faster than you know, like the you know the traditional methods, obviously. Yeah, if, if you put that picture back up, I I, I can. Uh... I can fill you in here a little bit. Uh, it, in, indeed, it was uh, not just a rock slide. Uh, just to give you perspective here, the distance from one side of the cliff at the narrowest part to the other side is 180 feet. Yeah, that's big. Um, that's big. So when you're, uh, and I've been in the boat right below this, that looks like just rapids there. That is uh, a solid wall of water that you have to look straight up 15 feet. Um, in the air. So when you're there, it's very obvious that uh, the fish were not, were not going to be able to pass that. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, la this happened last year and it wasn't, they call it a rock slide, but it was really the entire slab of the cliff on the left-hand side of the picture there. Uh, a, a huge slab fell right across the river. And so it is, it is a dam <laughs> of solid rock that went across that uh, river there. Mm. Um, so that's the, that was the situation. And last year, um, uh, a huge effort was made by uh, Department of Fisheries, uh, Fisheries and Ocean Canada. Yeah, and uh, we were up there um, uh, looking at the situation. We did not get the contract. They decided to try to uh, do trap and haul. Uh, mm -hmm. They did that uh, with helicopters um, where, they, where they were seining the fish, getting them into buckets. Uh, and helicoptering them past that uh, barrier. Uh, the survival, well, 
they were only able to move about uh, one tenth of the run past the barrier. And that was mostly happened very late in the season when the water level really dropped and most of the fish uh, found a way through at, the, at that late part of the season. Sure. By helicopter, they moved about 60,000 fish, I think. That's and uh, it's a lot of fish, a lot of effort. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, almost none of those fish survived. So um, when they went up to the tributaries, almost none of them made it. We did get a call back um, uh, this year, and uh, we are in the process of installing a system up there right now. Oh, great. Great news. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm thinking seining them, then, you know, putting them into a bucket and fly. I mean, that's just, I can just see scales flying off and, and just fish <laughs> not being in, in very it's, good shape after that. It's, it's also the hottest place in Canada. So in the middle of the day, it's uh, 42 degrees Celsius. And so it's, uh, it, incredibly tough environment. There's, uh, uh, no power there. The roads are dirt roads. It takes two hours to get to that site. Um, it's it's an it's a nearly impossible situation. Uh, I I think that, that we've got to give the Canadian government uh, some kudos that they've stuck with it. They didn't yep. just throw up their arms. And uh, uh, the First Nations up there have been very persistent about uh, um, the importance of this uh, of, of resolving this issue. Sure. And uh, there's as many as uh, uh, two to four million salmon that place that pass that location every year, wow. historically. Wow. Um, and so uh, last year they lost most of that run. If they lose it again this year, yeah. uh, they will have <laughs> they will have pretty much wiped out the the run because the two years ago there was also a very poor return. Mm -hmm. um, so they will have had three years of almost no return at all. And this is uh, this is like the Columbia of Columbia River of uh, of Canada. Yeah, huge sockeye run there, or historically a huge sockeye run. Co correct. Yeah, I, well over a million fish is are, are typically expected. So, but they've got the they've got Chinook all year. Um, they've got uh, very few steelhead, uh, but coho um, and uh, pinks come in every other year. So, so you've got the the five big species all running through there. Seen this year, then, huh? Sounds we'll like. be on the scene. Um, we need the water to cooperate up there. Uh, they they are uh, in the midst right now of uh, almost a hundred year flood water. It's very high. So uh, uh, you you said that there's not going to put a ladder there. Interestingly, they will have a ladder there. Really. Um, and uh, but that ladder will lead the fish right to our system, and uh -huh. then we will uh, take the fish past that barrier. So that that was uh, I assume that ladders to get it to a place where you can set your your stuff uh, right like a tight, right. tight spot to be uh, doing anything in there. Yeah, uh, the the uh, they've done a, a really uh, remarkable amount of, of work up there um, since last year, where they've created a, a basically an area that uh, uh, we can set up our equipment in and uh, and uh, be high enough out of the water that as the water rises up. Uh, we're not going to be inundated. It's it was not possible to put in a floating barge in that area because of the uh, the debris and so forth that's coming through the river. Sure. Well, let's see. We got some questions here. Let's uh, see what people are asking here. So AJ, it'd be amazing to see an Andrew Samus Yeah, I absolutely. Hope this is successful. I'm with you, AJ. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Travis Small. I think uh, that is the system, isn't it? Yeah, we installed that system uh, in 2017 as a pilot project for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, it was a one-year pilot. They uh, just last year got funding to to finish the downstream um, part of the project. This is a reintroduction effort. So uh, what we will be doing ultimately, we hope, is uh, on the upstream side, and we will be on the opposite side of the river where you may have seen us in 2017. So we're not there currently, but uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, that's their project, and uh, they've been great partners uh, over the years. Yeah, cool. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, good information. Thanks, Eric. Impressive information. There you go. Uh, let's see. Julie Jewell says, bringing, thanks for bringing this to the light. Vince is doing incredible work for our future. So, uh, cool. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So you're getting some love. That's good. That's good. And then 
Uh, what do we got here? This is uh, Tim Williams. Since, uh, buh, 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 buh. Oh, okay. Salmon Cannon. Uh, buh, buh, buh. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I can't even look at that link, so <laughs> we'll have to take a look at that. So, uh, so you said uh, maybe some stuff going on down here in California. You, you tried uh, Engelbright. Anything currently going on down here? There is no current projects in California. Uh, uh, we have that we're working on right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's not just because of COVID, I don't think, but uh, um, the uh, the uh, Potter Valley project, for example, um, which has been part of the PGE uh, issue, that that's an, to us an obvious one where we could help uh, there. Uh, there's, this is uh, again, where, you know, uh, <laughs> politics have, are, have sort of taken over, over this issue. Um, uh, however, um, it's interesting to see, uh, for example, the, some of the options that they're considering are really, uh, as their leading options there, are technology that was, uh, is 20 years or older. And, and it's actually based on some designs that proved not to work in, on the Columbia. So I'm just, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really hard. To, it's, uh, I think the intentions of everybody is always good, but uh, oftentimes that they don't, the decision makers uh, don't know enough. And, uh, and when you're trying to do things as a consensus as they are there, it just draws it out. So our, um, one of the things that we've tried to do in these situations also is, hey, if it's gonna take you 10 years to figure this out, um, why don't we uh, offer a, what we call passage as a service? And we'll put this in uh, without uh, you having to pay for all of this up front, it's more like a, a lease um, mm -hmm. arrangement where uh, we'll help the fish get past. Uh, you can establish, uh, reestablish the runs um, while you're figuring out what you want to do permanently in these situations. And and uh, you know, of course, we hope that the permanent decision <laughs> involves us. But even if it doesn't, uh, we've we've helped the recovery uh, in that interim period of time. So. Uh, we're, uh, we're for projects like that uh, at Potter Valley. Uh, there, there may be options where we can bring in financing to help make those things happen. Man, that is, they got to be biting, aren't they? These, you know, when you say, "Hey, we'll bring this in," uh, just you know, we'll, we'll worry about the money later. Just here, here's your thing. Get it going. I, I mean, we, I, we always that. have. Uh, <laughs> there are always fans, and then there's always those that are. Um, have other objectives uh, for whatever reason. And so, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it, uh, we, we can only do this. We can only repeat, uh, bring people, educate them. Uh, we do shows like this so that uh, people can become aware. And then every independent study that uh, has been done, we put it up on our website. So what we're really doing, and I think oftentimes agencies are caught in this, they wanna do what they know works or they think, think works because it's been done before there's right. precedent, and then they're like less likely to get sued if they've done something. And if it doesn't work, well, it, it it's something that was done before. So when you're using a newer technology like this, it's um, I think it's a perceived riskiness. Mm -hmm. uh, it in fact, uh, what has happened in every case that we've been involved in, uh, that the, the the people that are involved always end up uh, getting promotions and other things that's that <laughs> that happen because uh, they've just saved the agency lots of money and uh and time and so forth so though the word the word does get around and uh it's better you know when others are talking about us than us talking about us yeah of course of course well it's just it's just such a cool thing i i hope uh i hope people keep talking about it uh let's see what else we got here uh what was your educational background he's uh wrapping up his master's program in fluvial geomorphology so he's a he's a river guy. <laughs> so uh, so what uh, what what I'm, I'm guessing you had nothing. You, you didn't go to school for whooshing. <laughs> no, I, I did think I was going to be a marine biologist growing up. Okay. And, and uh, so that was that was my focus uh, until I went to a college at, uh, that at USC, actually, down there in California, that uh, they didn't offer anything in marine biology. Um, and I I, uh, I got a political science and economics major and became an attorney um, uh, and uh, worked in the software industry uh, 
for a number of years for Adobe Systems. And uh, it was really uh, an opportunity to get back into um, uh, I, t taking what I would really learned in all these areas. And I, I think in this space here, um, maybe because of the legal background, it, it allowed me to say, you know, we can work our way through this rather than just being intimidated by it. And, and uh, I, I always would tell, um, you know, the, the folks that I work with at, at Adobe as in-house counsel and so forth, you know, if, you, if, if legal is getting in the way, it just means that you're not being creative enough. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, you, you got to understand the legal uh, rules and then figure out how you get through it. This has been a real challenge <laughs> in this space. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, it's, uh, it's very satisfying because we, we really feel like we're, we're doing good for the fish, um, but also uh, you know, good for mankind. And, and uh, so we have lots of uh, our team, our employees that uh, come work for us. Uh, you know, they, they believe in the mission of what we're trying to do. And uh, that passion carries through to uh, every project that we work on. Yeah, that's that's very true, and that's that's. I mean, what a what a cool job to have to where you're doing something that's that's positive like that, and you've redeemed yourself. Basically, what you're saying is you you start off with the dark side, and as an attorney, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I wasn't on the litigation side, uh, but, <laughs> but yeah. uh, I just had I, a lawyer joke. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, let's see. We got another question here. If you got the time, let's see here. If I hit the right button, uh, yeah, politics. Uh, let's see. Water is far more valuable than fish. Yeah. Uh, don't all ladders in existence lead to hatcheries? Uh, no. All the uh, maybe most of the ladders in California do, but the uh, you have the Columbia there, where all those ladders to get over eighteen dams on that system or whatever it is. So. Um, uh, Boy, you could uh, you could do some damage on the Columbia and Snake and Clearwater and all that with uh, with Wushan. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know there's a lot of dams up in the Sierra Nevadas that have no passage up that high, yep. uh, partly because ladders probably wouldn't work in those situations. But the because of the warmer waters down there, uh, I, there is talk about uh, placing them up there, and so uh, there's an opportunity I think to deliver the fish up into these uh, cooler waters new habitat and uh and then we do have to worry about how to get them down through the warm waters again um but uh that's a that that's where the opportunities are in california to really uh, uh re-establish the runs through the full watershed yeah it's uh, as, as i'm sure you're aware there's a lot of uh a lot of money been spent in the last you know 20 years on on studies of getting Chinook over Oroville or, you know, Nimbus or Folsom, Shasta, Inglebright. I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of talk. Not much has happened. <laughs> I know there's. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, most of the time we can do the system, put the system in and see if it works for less money than the study itself. That that's the reality. Yeah, there, you of it. <laughs> there you go. And that should be in the story right there. Right. <laughs> Let's just do this already. People come on. You're listening. Uh, Come on. <laughs> uh, it, it there there uh, there are reasons that uh, you know the rules are there. Uh, there are in, in when you make a change, there's an environmental impact. You already have an altered state. I think that we know that in these situations, and so it really comes down to having the leadership um, uh, to carry it through. And where where we see that the projects work uh, and why we're on a show like this, it is the fishermen, it is the uh, local communities and so forth who, uh, when they say, hey, this is important to us, uh, the way that it works is if you put the political pressure on um, the politicians, the politicians then feel safe to put the pressure on the bureaucrats. And that's the way that you get the stuff to move. Uh, all we can do is say, here's the technology and here's the, the, the science behind it as to why this works and, uh, and it should start to move. And that's what we're seeing. Um, California is a little slow, I will say to adopt here, um, which surprises me in some ways because you, you know, so much of Silicon Valley and so forth. Um, but in ag tech, uh, you know, it's taken off. It will happen here uh, for the fish as well. 
Well, I sure hope so because the uh, the technology to me is just just so cool, so cool. And I just want to personally thank you for all you guys are doing because I can see that someday that's you know down here it's going to benefit us. It's certainly working uh, up where you guys are, and I just hope hope this catches on because we need stuff like this. We need people like you guys thinking outside the box and coming up with cool technology and. Uh, Especially, it's cheaper. Come on, people! It's easier on the fish. What are we waiting up for? You know. Like, <laughs> yeah. The, the yep. thing you yep. said about the study being more expensive than the the product. I just, I mean, that that's kind of just throwing me for a loop right now. Thinking about that, you know, it's uh, there's so many frustrating aspects of, as I'm sure you know, dealing with all the all the various agencies and all that. It just gets to be a lot of red tape. But yeah, it, it's not it's not all them. I mean, it, the the industry has built up around a consulting uh, framework, and so you have. Uh, Every study ends with we need another study. That right. um, every study ends that way, and and uh, it, it's uh, not true. <laughs> if you do the study right the, and cover what needs to be covered, and if you're focused on what you are, most of the time what happens is the study gets so broad and it's it's trying to cover uh, solutions that uh, don't exist or or ideas that don't exist. But if you focus it on those things that are out there that are known and say what will be the benefit of doing this it becomes much clearer. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, just got to keep staying the course. So is there any uh, any new technology in the works? Any Anything you can talk about or? Uh... Well, the, the, the official recognition technology that we were talking about there is where a lot of our focus is. Uh, what we think ultimately, uh, why the agencies are coming around to that. Uh, we had the system in on the Columbia at the Bonneville Dam, an Army Corps project last year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from an accuracy standpoint of uh, really counting and seeing every fish uh, to be able to tell what are injured. For example, in the Columbia, they always talk about, I think, 3.4% uh, of the fish were eaten by sea lions, they, they right. estimated. Well, we were able to see that 12% of the, of the Chinook salmon coming through had a major injury from pinniped. So it's not it's not a 3.5% uh damage that the pinnipeds are doing. It's it's 15% of the run. Wow. So it's things like that, that uh, uh, if we can make then decisions, you could even, you know, in an extreme situation, you could take a, a fish, for example, that's injured, and you could divert it over into a tank where they're, they're treated for antibiotics and then let, uh, they can continue on. Oh, if you wanted to do that as a, as a fisheries person. So I think that the data is going to become so compelling to those fishery managers um, of using these kinds of systems that this will this will drive uh, the technology. And it it is hard to get data on fish. I mean, it's you know you can look at through the counting windows, but if you have too much turbidity in the water, you don't see the fish. Uh, uh, if uh, up in the Columbia River, for example, this last year there were seven and a half million American shad. That's right. a uh, not a native fish, um, and just ten years ago there was only a few hundred thousand of those uh, shad coming into the river. So if you look at the biomass that's coming back into the Columbia River, it's at historical levels. It's just all shad. Right. Uh, so from our perspective, you can say, you know, the agencies will say today, that, well, that's not an invasive species. Well, it's not an invasive species because you haven't named it an invasive species yet, right. because you don't know the impact that it's having. Um, so it's, it's, it's this kind of semantic, uh, uh, set that I think is really troubling. It, it's helps the politicians prioritize because, oh, that's not an invasive species. I'm going to put it over here at Northern Pike, um, because we've called that an invasive species, but, but you could put a, a system in on the first dam of the Columbia river, for example, and remove all 7 million shad. Mm-hmm in one year, they'd probably come back for a year, the next year. And, yep. and within two or three years, you would have the entire river cleaned up of American shed. Sure. And, and it's without any effort. So you can, you can decide that you don't want to do that. But, uh, if you're interested in getting habitat back, <laughs> as it seems like by far the easiest way to do it. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so, as far as uh, we've got another question here, so, you know, the winter run is a big issue and, uh, you know, hot button issue in the Sacramento River, winter run Chinook. 
And uh, Bob Prinzo would like to know, has anybody contacted you about getting them over Shasta into the McLeod system? We have not had that discussion yet. Uh, uh, so bring them to our attention. <laughs> yes, yes, let's have that discussion. <laughs> that would be great. So, um, well, man, Vince, it's been just, it's really been uh, just great to talk to you. I really appreciate you coming on and everything you do there. It's, it's, it's amazing. If people want to learn more, it's whoosh, two H's. Two O's, two H's, right? I got that spelled right, don't I? You got that right. Yep, absolutely. And uh, what else? You guys have uh, Whoosh Facebook. Uh, I've seen you on Instagram. Uh, where else can people find information about about your uh, organization and what you guys are doing? Yeah, that's uh, and our website, as you've said here, are the are three of the biggest. Uh, we've got a LinkedIn site and so forth too. Uh, and uh, you know, we we certainly AFS and some of the. Um, uh, Typical fisheries uh, conferences that uh, in normal debt times are are out there. We we're usually trying to present at those. Uh, we're oftentimes you know it's a, a, a more narrow scientific focus. But uh, that I I think the more people that understand the potential of what this could do, if you take that facial recognition technology and you apply it to an entire watershed, think about how you can manage the entire watershed sure. just by knowing exactly where the fish are. Um, and uh, and uh, exact counts. Uh, so you know, as a fisherman, I, I I think we're all frustrated at times. The the estimates that are out in the ocean, and by the time they get to the river, it's, uh, everything's changing uh, uh, all the time. I think uh, part of the problem that we're all having here is the data just is not good enough. And uh, and if we can improve the data, we're going to make better decisions, and we're going to improve the runs. Well, uh, we are with you, and uh, we've got, uh, let's see, Larry says uh, thanks for uh, all the updates on your technology, and I, I think we all can agree with that. We've got uh, Craig saying awesome stuff, so I think we're, we're getting some, some people to take a little notice here, and what we're going to have to do is um, have you maybe come down, our, our, I'm the vice president of the Guides Association down here, and uh, we've, we're getting some getting some stuff done here. And so maybe we need to use our contacts and have, uh, you know, get you in the right uh, through the doors. And uh, so I think, I think there's some stuff we can maybe get together on. So we'll, we'll have to get, get with you down the road here soon and um, uh, chat about maybe what, I mean, who knows? It doesn't hurt to start uh, spreading the word anyway. I agree. I, that's totally the case. And then in some instances, you know, We've talked about this. I, I think specific projects could even be crowdfunded. Um, and uh, if, if you start bringing money to the table, uh, that that moves things. So uh, it's it's a, it's something that people get excited about and you can see a result. Uh, you know, you were asking about fish rescue situations. We have been called a couple times in California when uh, salmon had been trapped in various river situations. Uh, and uh, uh, in each instance, the, the uh, fish and wildlife did not uh, decided to do it. One year they moved them with uh, helicopters again and they had 90% mortality. Um, and the next year they decided uh, that they weren't going to move them at all and they all died. So uh, I, I think you, you know, at some point you've tried the other things uh, and we know what the results are going to be. Uh, uh, so you, you can, uh, you can uh, feel safe in trying something new. <laughs> Not, not seeing a lot of downside uh, from from where I'm sitting. So uh, anyway, well, uh, it's been great talking to you. And again, we will uh, we'll, we'll have to get together and, and chat about some stuff um, down the Anytime. road. Here. And uh, again, thanks so much for all you guys are doing. And whoosh! I just feel like I got to give that whoosh. The <laughs> yeah, that was it's you know it's it's the sound of the fish going through the tube. It's so I whoosh. love it. I love it. It's it's so cool. So uh, whoosh two O's and two S or two H's dot com. And uh, Vince, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Let's do this again sometime. And uh, and let's uh, let's talk offline. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, that was uh, that was really really cool stuff. I that, that stuff gets me so pumped up. I just want to. I want to like get that on everywhere. Get, get let's let's get whooshed everywhere. I mean that's just really 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 cool stuff. So anyway, thanks uh, so much to Vince for uh, being on the show. And don't forget 
the old Douglas giveaway. Let's see. I got the thing here. There's your, uh, if you go to the website, you can, uh, that's what it's going to look like. You just sign on there. And uh, again, that web address to win the Douglas rod is, is there it is, fishwithjdcontest.com. And that's going to go through uh, June 12th around midnight. And then we're going to randomly draw a winner. And, uh, and you're going to get to pick a rod and come on the show. We'll shoot the breeze and uh, have a good time. And uh, so that'll be fun. So head on over to that website. When you get a chance, just put your info in there and you will be automatically entered into the contest. So um, that should be cool. Let's see. we got one more, one more comment. Oh, it's from Kathy. She says, fish on. Same to you, Kathy. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, for all of you out there in TV land. In. And uh, don't forget to hit the old subscribe and all that, like it and all that good stuff. Uh, uh, it's always cool. So uh, we will catch you same bad time, same bad channel next week at uh, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And uh, until then, you guys have a good week and I uh, hope you catch some fish. <laughs>